Well, hello there. I'm Haslinda Amin. Thank you for joining us on Greening Trade. Uh, this session will be done in two parts. The first 30 minutes will be a moderated panel discussion. The next 30 minutes will be a detailed exchange that's limited only to four members. Of course, of this virtual WEF week, we heard from global leaders sounding the alarm on climate threats, calling for your response reiterating that green growth is absolutely possible. And uh, to that end, trade can play a big part in saving the planet if it is done better, if it makes a shift to no or low carbon. Uh, right now, international trade accounts for about 25% of greenhouse gas emissions, but the links between trade and climate have often been underexplored. And that's mostly because Policymakers tend to look at both trade and climate in isolation. And add to that, trade in the environment communities may not necessarily see eye to eye. Uh, still, the 2030 agenda calls on all countries to use trade to create a more sustainable, a more inclusive, a more resilient world. So how do we get there? What trade approaches and actions are needed? What role can business play in the pursuit of net zero carbon emissions. Well, today we're really privileged to have with us Frank Riester, France's Minister Delegate for Foreign Trade and Economic Attractiveness, Jerome Ahon, Global Senior Partner and Clifford Chance, Anna Kritikov, Head of Sustainable Development at Glencore International. Anna, gentlemen, thank you for being here. Minister, bonjour, and that's the extent of my French. Um, let's start with you. I mean, is there a conflict between trade and environment protection and climate action? Can, can they be complementary? Essentially, are they friends, foes, or are they frenemies? Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, you know, first, perhaps I, I should say that uh, it's quite unre unrealistic to uh, consider that we should uh, uh, do uh, without trade. Uh, you know, uh, natural resources are uh, not uh, shared equally, and uh, I think that no country can uh, uh, be entirely um, autonomous. And so um, trade has brought uh, uh, many things to uh, many people and, uh, uh, and has brought many people out of poverty. And uh, international value chains um, lead to um, efficient specialization um, according to uh, competitive uh, edges. And so um, trade also um, allows a supply chain to deliver indispensable goods across the globe. Uh, and so we will therefore um, maintain uh, our economy in uh, open economy. Uh, and we want um, the EU uh, to remain um, open. And so for that, we need to have a consistency uh, between um, <clears throat> our sustainable um, development agenda and uh, our trade practices. We have to have a constituency between um, efforts we ask people and ask company and the kind of um, trade um, we are supporting. And so um, it's very important to consider that um, in a political standpoint, uh, this um, uh, efforts of we ask to people are not diminished by the in increase of imports from area that not apply the same ambitions or the same standards. And so we have the globally to, to create uh, more ambitious, more ambition and more standards so that we could um, globally um, increase uh, reserves of our policy instead of um, creating the condition of, uh, for a race to, um, to the bottom, in fact. And so perhaps um, I would like to, to give you two examples of what we are going to do or we are doing. Uh, first is the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, to fight uh, against the um, uh, carbon leakage uh, in a WTO uh, 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 in, in a WTO uh, compatible way. Um, uh, it's uh, for for us very important to be compatible to the WTO. And the second um, example is how we deal with uh, deforestation uh, imported. Um, it's, it's unbelievable that uh, we could imagine that um, increasing trade um, 
uh, uh, increasing trade to uh, be uh, creating that that increasing trade could create more uh, imported deforestation, and so that. Uh, we have to create uh, instruments within the, re the EU regulation to uh, legislation <clears throat> to uh, fight against um, deforestation imported. And that's the problem we have uh, in the <clears throat> uh, trade agreement with Mercosur. And so we are trying to find solution to be sure that the increase of our trade with Mercosur um, wouldn't uh, increase uh, the uh, imported deforestation. And um, we, we believe that um, uh, it's important to, uh, to, to create this regulation uh, to put pressure as well uh, to the private sector uh, to be more uh, uh, fair uh, in, the, in this kind of, um, of topic as well. Putting pressure on the private sector, Minister, I want to bring Jerome into this conversation then. Jerome, how do you think trade policymakers can better align incentives with sustainable zero emission supply chains? Uh, how would this help companies enact ESG commitments? Thank you very much, uh, Haslinda, and, and thank you very much, first of all, for having me on this panel. And also, good morning, everyone, or good day, everyone, on this last day of the Davos week. So thank you for joining on this uh, last Friday. Um, I agree, Haslinda, you know, the move to net zero must be supported by, by trade policies. And you said in your introduction, you spoke about friends or foes, uh, and there is this sort of myth that trade and climate are somehow uh, unnatural bedfellows, that they are mutually exclusive and that they do work in two different worlds, you know, the WTO world and the Paris Agreement world. And that doesn't have to be the case. Trade and climate can go hand in hand and should go hand in hand, and trade can be a driver of environmental and sustainable productivity and efficiency. And there isn't much that governments can do to help move the needle on this. So let me mention four points. First of all, there is the elimination of tariffs on, very, on environmentally beneficial goods and to remove barriers on env environmentally friendly services. And that's a clear opportunity and can be done uh, in a way that is entirely consistent with the broader trade liberalizing objectives of the WTO. Um, now, many will be aware of the negotiations for an environmental goods agreement between 2014 and 2016. Uh, those regrettably came to, uh, to an end, did not succeed. We can get into that later, but um, there are some moves to reinvigorate those discussions and that's good. Uh, secondly, there is clearly more that can be done to remove non uh, tariff barriers uh, to trade in environmental goods. So technical, environmental and other standards can be important uh, and can be part of any regulatory systems, but those policies should not unnecessarily increase the costs of adopting technologies which help businesses to reduce the carbon intensity of their production processes. And thirdly, and this is a big one, and we heard uh, President Biden speak about it two days ago, it is the uh, removal of fossil fuel subsidies. These obviously slow down efforts to decarbonize businesses and again, we can get into more detail uh, later if you'd like. Um, but it was very encouraging to see President Biden speak about that the day before yesterday uh, uh, and in his executive orders. And finally, and uh, Minister Riesta already mentioned it a moment ago, uh, there is the big theme of carbon border adjustments. Uh, those impose additional taxes on carbon intense imports. And if introduced, they are likely to have a really significant impact on uh, supply chains. Now, Carbon border adjustments, and I heard the minister say it has to be done within the WTO framework. And that's a big debate again, because they are scare, scary on the one hand. Uh, they can be very complicated, they can be fraud prone, uh, and they risk country protectionism. On the other hand, they excite, because if done right, they will, will help adjust hard debate industries. Um, so I think those there are four areas in which governments can help, and it really is the way to bring the world of WTO and Paris uh, together. So let me stop there, as Linda. Thank you. Uh, we'll pick up on uh, fossil fuel subsidies as well as uh, carbon tax slightly later. But first, Anna, I want to come to you and talk about the circular economy. Uh, it is an important way to tackle emissions for many sectors, and it's been estimated that eliminating waste through circular economy could bring benefits worth four and a half trillion dollars. But as, I mean, as production and consumption is global, what are the supply chain considerations for recycling materials here? Thank you, Heslinda, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, when we talk about the global nature uh, of production and consumption, exactly as you say, 
I think it's also important to think about uh, carbon footprints also in that holistic way. And I suppose from a Glencore perspective, we're a little bit, we look at it from, from two lenses. We look at it as a mining company with a footprint, and we look at it with this, as a company with a significant presence in, in recycling. So looking at the end use of these, uh, of these metals and, and giving them a second life. But let me, take, so let me take a step back and start at the start um, and think about uh, this holistic perspective that we must talk about and that trade is, is fundamental to. Um, I think any transition strategy must take into account the full spectrum of, of operational portfolio and commodity impacts. And you alluded to that when you talked about the role that trade plays in, uh, in the global uh, carbon footprint. I suppose from our perspective, we uh, looked at our startup when we when we started thinking about our transition and uh, our transition strategy. We thought about our industrial footprint, but we quickly realized that really it's only ten percent of our total footprint when we consider the uh, emissions from the use of our products. So in our case, uh, our commitment to net zero covers our full footprint, and and we are uh, the first mining company to do so. And we believe that that's critical to meaningfully participating in the global transition to carbon neutrality and participating in this whole of business, whole of world, whole of industry uh, uh, thinking. And I think, you know, when we think specifically about circularity, we of course start by talking about um, contraction of, of some of the high emitting sectors, we've alluded to fossil fuels already. Um, but of course we also say, okay, so recycling is, is key here. And, and as, you, as you alluded to that as well. Um, I think what we see in recycling today, and this is where I think there's such an important uh, role for greater coherence uh, between policy and, and, and action, is that we absolutely see today a growing interest in uh, consumer interest in sustainability credentials and responsible sourcing and recycling content. And that's great. And that then, of course, drives uh, greater uh, programming by metal using companies to take back products to collect the, the, the waste. But this is where we come up against a barrier. And the barrier is that um, it, as we are looking to responsibly and safely collect and recycle the scrap, we are then contending with a global uh, package of regulations. And, and of course, some are, it's, it's, it's unfair to generalize, uh, but as, as of course, some are far more sophisticated than others. But the broad regulation is still anchored in thinking of scrap as a hazard and is taking precautions to address that, whether you're talking about collection, transportation, or treatment. And so in practice, what we see is that for companies that are complying with, with this regulation, it's incredibly difficult uh, to, 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 to recycle at, at scale. I'll give you an example. Some of our uh, the scrap that our customers have collected for us to recycle has been sitting in the country of origin for a year, not because there's any problem with payment or any problem with the customer or any, any problem, but because the regulation is so complex that dealing through the intricacies of the storage, the shipping, the transportation is, is incredibly complex and is very much framed within that context. And I think one of the downsides of that, besides, of course, uh, limiting the ability of the sector, the, the formal sector to grow, is the proliferation of the informal sector. And I think that theme is so important, and it's something that, that the minister has alluded to as well, the uh, community uh, impacts, the, the, the proliferation of informal practices that um, result in unsafe and poor environmental uh, uh, practices are, are, are made... Are, 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 can be addressed through um, an evolved uh, uh, regulation um, that will address these questions of how do we think about recycling in this new world? How do we think of it as part of the package? And how do we make sure that vulnerable people are not left behind or further marginalized as we're looking to, to, embrace, this, uh, to embrace and enable this transition to carbon neutrality? I guess in a way it requires a mindset change too. Minister, I want to bring you back into the, the, this conversation. France has always been a strong advocate of strong environmental protections in trade agreements. What do you think ambitious trade partners could do to better support sustainable zero emission supply chains? Uh, first, we believe that um, trade agreements 
are good tools to ensure consistency coherence between our climate ambition and uh, trade. And, and so we, we want to use uh, in the future even more uh, the trade agreements to move, to help us to move on these uh, issues. Um, and for instance, we want in the future that in all uh, future trade agreements, the respect of the Paris Agreement would be uh, an uh, essential clause of the agreement. And we'll have to, to in which we, uh, we, work, we are working on how to monitor the implementation of the Paris Agreement within uh, the relationship between uh, uh, the, 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 the different countries with, with, who, with uh, which we, we are signing some agreements. And second, we, we think that um, we can already um, monitoring the implementation of uh, trade um, sustainable development chapters, because you know, uh, we, we have already in the bilateral agreements between the EU and other countries, some uh, uh, engagement of sustainable development. And so uh, we think that we uh, have to uh, better um, uh, check the implementation of these chapters. We, we can see that uh, these chapters are, are already binding because we, we, uh, the panel uh, that, was, um, uh, that has worked on the uh, eu Curry uh, agreement has shown that there are uh, some uh, issues that are not um, uh, correctly um, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, taking a to, uh, taking a, take, taken into account, sorry, uh, by Curry, uh, and so uh, we we are putting some pressure on Curry for that. But we think that in the future we'll have to put some sanctions in the agreement in the chapters, so that we could uh, directly put sanctions if uh, the uh, the commitments are not uh, achieved. And third, um, we think that uh, in the multilateral level, we have to do better. We have to, to put uh, sustainable development even uh, more in a multilateral agreement in the WTO. And the reform of the WTO will be useful for that. And we think that uh, in the ongoing negotiation, we could be better, we could do better. And I could uh, say that um, the fishery negotiation could be a good example of how we could uh, put more um, sustainable development in, uh, in the agreements and in negotiations. And I, I, would, I totally agree with Anna that it's very important to, uh, to, 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 do, to, to use uh, trade agreements to, uh, to uh, take uh, uh, the different uh, private uh, actors to um, a more circular economy, uh, to, to a more circular uh, proce uh, processes. And so uh, it, will be, um, it will be at the heart of uh, our uh, ministry uh, conference, ministerial conference at the WTO level uh, in, uh, at the end of the year. Uh, specifically, perhaps, on plastic issues. Uh, Jerome, uh, as you indicated slightly earlier, sometimes it's also about removing incentives as it is about introducing incentives. And you mentioned fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, by some calculation, uh, global carbon emissions will be cut by 20 percent. And by doing that, government coffers can be uh, added by trillions of dollars. Yet, this is not happening fast enough. Why is that so? And what can be done about that? Well, thank you, Aslind. I mean, the, the, the abolishment of, of fossil fuel subsidies is obviously politically fraught. There is, of course, a big uh, lobby for uh, keeping them in place. Uh, they've been talking about abolishing fossil fuel subsidies, I think, since 2009. Um, but, you know, the stars are now more aligned. We've, we've heard this week a lot about, you know, the net zero ambitions and targets of, 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 of you know, of China, of the EU, of the, of, and, and now of the US. And I think if you listened again, as I said in my first opening remarks to President Biden, and to John Kerry uh, earlier this week also here in Davos about um, eliminating fossil fuel subsidies in the US, which is particularly, of course, a, a country where there's been a lot of support for these subsidies. I mean, that is a, a big move. Uh, I think the fossil fuel subsidies stand at something like $500 billion, and they clearly distort you know, existing trade flows and incentivize 
continued reliance on these high emission production processes. So I think taking away these fossil fuel uh, subsidies will make a di big difference. And we could also think that at a time when government finances are even more strained as governments seek to respond to COVID-19 and there's sort of less fiscal space, the potential to redirect these environmentally harmful subsidies to other initiatives is, is I think, significant. Uh, so I think we'll see real uh, move di here, there. And I think the more certainties that exist for companies about the long-term shape of these policies and of these subsidies disappearing, the more willing businesses will be to make the big shifts that are needed. Thank you. And Anna, uh, as you suggested earlier, Glencore has been pretty successful in, in meeting, exceeding its ESG targets. Part of the whole equation is also social inclusion. Take us through the thinking behind that and how it's benefited, uh, I guess, it's provided more equality. Yeah, and, uh, thanks, Ms. Linda. And um, I think the, this question of um, inclusion is so much at the heart of what we're talking about. Um, and as COVID-19 brings more into focus questions of inequality, of social detriment caused by the, by the pandemic, we need to ensure that as we are uh, working to create and, and, and establish a, a low carbon economy, we're not uh, we're not leaving people uh, people behind. Um, uh, as we think about that from from an energy perspective, the importance of inclusive energy and the importance of again thinking about that from a policy perspective cannot be understated. But also, I think as as supply chains, um, you know, we started this panel by talking about the global nature of, of production and consumption, and that just continues to be, I think, a, a sort of a, a thread that that can, that weaves through this this conversation. Um, one example that we've uh, really uh, grappled with and engaged with is um, the, 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 the commodity of cobalt, you know, an, an essential uh, commodity needed for electric vehicles, for, for batteries. Um, it's, 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 it underpins in a lot of ways. It's essential to the, to the transition to low carbon economy. However, um, we've seen how uh, legitimate, absolutely legitimate concerns about terrible operating practices and child labor that's associated with the artisanal mining of that cobalt in, uh, in, in, in parts of the Democratic Republic of Congo has risked marginalizing further already vulnerable people as their, their concerns, uh, concerns would start driving uh, sort of purchasing behaviors for, for, for the commodity. Um, so we've been working with the whole, uh, with, with the cobalt supply chain, with our partners in, in that chain that with, uh, with who we work uh, commercially, um, as well as, as, as on the ground. We've looked to address this challenge by uh, becoming a founding member of the Fair Cobalt Alliance, which is a whole of supply chain partnership that recognizes that, uh, that artisanally mined cobalt, that cobalt produced uh, uh, by uh, people uh, you know, very, very poor, very vulnerable people can absolutely play a legitimate role in the supply chain, but that we must take action to eradicate child labor and, and improve operating conditions uh, in, the, in, the, in those cooperatives. And I think it's that, the, the reason I give that example is because I think we must as supply chains, and, uh, and, and obviously we're looking at, uh, at support from, from policy as well, to be mindful of how, uh, as, we're, as we're looking to towards not only uh, a, a low carbon economy, but a successful low carbon economy, that we don't inadvertently widen uh, the, gap, uh, the gap of inequality. Minister, uh, earlier you talked about the border carbon tax as planned by the EU. How far do you think that will prevent carbon leakage? Do you see the move even encouraging non-EU companies exporting to Europe to cut emission and in turn cut what's charged to them? Or could the move lead to protectionist response by other trading blocks instead? Um, it's, uh, for, for us, we believe that um, uh, this kind of mechanism uh, will um, uh, force uh, other countries to uh, be more uh, ambitious uh, in uh, in that field, and that uh, the, the 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 cost um, uh, cost more important to uh, to um, to produce with uh, within a green way um, will be um, will be um, compensed by uh, the by the mechanism. 
so that uh, we could uh, put pressure on uh, countries that do not apply uh, this kind of um, uh, of a good uh, way of producing and uh, and so the difficulty is that uh, we don't want uh, uh, that uh, it could be a, a kind of a, um, competitiveness tool but a, a, a tool to um, to put every, everyone uh, in the, in a good uh, in a good way to produce and that's that's the difficulty we have um, uh, in front of us, so that the, this mechanism could be accepted uh, by uh, by everyone. In fact, even by uh, the U.S., even by China, and even by all the uh, the country that are engaged in uh, in the climate uh, fight, uh, and uh, we have to convince uh, our uh, partners. Uh, of the of the pertinence of the of this mechanism. Jerome, do you agree? Do you think it will encourage the others to follow suit? Um, I think it's, uh, that would be the hope, and I do agree with the minister. It's a matter of communication, communication, and communication to getting to understanding why it is needed. Because without the the, the, the carbon border adjustments, there is the risk of leakage. Uh, you know, both in getting uh, uh, imports from from countries where there are less environmental standards, and the other way, businesses moving out of, for example, region to the EU to countries where that is the case. And as I said in my introduction, you know, it's both on the one hand these adjustments are on the one hand scary; uh, they can be very very complex, lead to uh, a lot of bureaucracy um, and uh, and also lead to protectionism, which is why there's this concern. And that is why there's a direct conflict with, you know, the, the, the liberalized trade idea behind the WTO thinking. Um, but at the same time, uh, they can have very positive benefits as well and level the playing field. So I do agree, agree with the minister, but it will be uh, one that is potentially fraught with uh, conflict and as we know currently the WTO is not very operational certainly not the appellate body uh, so how do you resolve disputes now I'm a litigation lawyer so you know it means a lot of business for people like me but I don't think it is what <laughs> will uh, what will further the cause of sustainability so I think that whole bringing together of the WTO and Paris thinking as I said in my introduction uh, and you mentioned it, friend or foe and are they strange bedfellows I think there's a lot of work and thinking that continues to need to go into that and I heard the minister say you know we want to make these cross-border adjustments, WTO compliant. But there's a level of complexity there, but I, I think it is the right direction at the moment until there is a real level playing field. That's right. I mean, the reorganization of the WTO could be a step in the right direction. And I know we talked about how there are lots and lots of challenges, but we've got to consider the role of clean technology. Clean energy can play a significant role in the transition to a green economy. It helps resources be used in a more sustainable manner. Waste products can be recycled. The question really is access to these clean technology. What are the key issues here? Thank you. Uh, I guess those are, uh, it's one of the, the, the big ones. Um, look, I think the, the, first, the first barrier, um, and, and really kind of going back to, to the foundations of this, the principal barrier is access to the commodities required for these technologies. We cannot build uh, solar panels, uh, wind, wind turbines. We cannot uh, look at uh, the transformation of the energy systems that, that we need. We cannot uh, electrify uh, transportation without access to metal. Um, we've done some modeling uh, of the various climate scenarios that have been developed. Um, and we see in, under any scenario, whether we continue as we are or we achieve that radical transformation, we see a material uplift in demand for metals such as copper, cobalt, zinc, uh, nickel. Um, and of course, there's only so much uh, metal that, 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 that exists in the world. Um, you know, I think we've seen under some of the scenarios, demand for copper expecting to double by 2050 and for cobalt to quadruple. Where does that metal come from? And of course, recycling will be part of the answer. And we've talked about that. We've talked about the fantastic potential, but also some of the uh, barriers that, that we see from our perspective today. Um, but I think we also have to think about the fact that we will uh, need to access new metal. Uh, recycling is not going to be able to fulfill all the needs. We will need new metal. Um, and this is going to be uh, made more challenging going forward because uh, the new mines that we know of, the new the, the reserves that we know of today that are not being mined, 
are increasingly uh, located in hard to get to, high risk, difficult, difficult to operate in, in places um, with, or that, that carry with them uh, very significant social and environmental uh, considerations. And again, and I've said, as I've said before, it is so important to make sure that we don't lose sight of those, of those, uh, of those considerations and make sure that we work on them hand in hand. And so I think um, it's, it's an important, uh, it's, it's a barrier, it's a consideration. And I think there is uh, some thought to be put to how uh, policymakers in some of these um, mineral rich countries and how their partners in, in uh, sophisticated jurisdictions such as the European Union, for example, don't lose sight of how to continue to enable access to that new metal while also not compromising on, uh, on the importance of responsible operating practices. How do we move those hand in hand? Uh, there is a question here from uh, a participant. And uh, Minister, maybe I'll pose this to you. Do you agree that in the new normal, we must reject trade at all costs and push instead for trade to be built on credible inclusivity, sustainability, integrity, and transparency? And I guess, you know, amid the pandemic, uh, there's always an urge to put yourself first. The beginning of, uh, of the panel that, uh, in my opinion, uh, it's uh, unbelievable to think that we uh, uh, should uh, do without trade because uh, it's useful for many people and it's useful for economy and many people uh, in development countries uh, are waiting for um, some services, some products we have in uh, some other countries uh, since a long time. So the issue is how to produce um, and uh, and to exchange and how to produce in a greener way, recycling, uh, uh, thanks to innovation. So we have to invest a lot in innovation, and we have to be sure that the the increase of trade uh, would not have a negative impact in specific ways. I talked um, sooner about uh, deforestation um, and. Uh, uh, I, I could uh, I could uh, say that uh, uh, the, the the trade could be even could be uh, perhaps a way to uh, uh, to push some countries to do better uh, in in uh, in sustainable development. Uh, that's uh, really in our own mind in France and in Europe. Uh, it's to use the, the, the lever, the, the tool of trade agreements of uh, trade uh, partnership to push uh, people that need to, do tr to, to trade with us to, uh, to do better in, uh, in uh, sustainable development, in uh, biodiversity, uh, in uh, deforestation, in climate uh, uh, change um, fight. So, uh, no, I think that we have to, to, to be uh, open. We have to be um, uh, determined to maintain uh, international trade uh, for all the reasons I evocated jobs, uh, prosperity, uh, uh, access to services and to, uh, to uh, certain products for many countries. But um, uh, we have to invest a lot in technologies so that uh, the way we produce uh, could be uh, uh, more sustainable. And we have to use the tool of uh, trade agreements to push everyone to go up uh, in uh, our practices um, to produce, to consume, uh, and I think it's possible. Uh, the, the, the fact that um, the US uh, come back uh, in the Paris Agreement and the, the fact that Biden and Kerry and, uh, and the new administration is so implicated, uh, so in, in, uh, involved uh, in uh, sustainable development issues is a good um, news for all the world. And I think as China is uh, um, uh, um, say, uh, says that um, they are really com committed on these issues as well, I think um, we could do much better in the years to come. On that very optimistic note, Minister, yes. uh, I'd like yes. to thank you. Jerome, as well as Anna, for the insights uh, today. We wrap up the first uh, session of this hour-long session. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you for joining the conversation.